Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 249, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or text me at 202-930-1109, and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 249th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name's Tim Mooney. Thanks so much for joining. Very exciting. Um, as you heard, this is the 249th edition. So next week's episode, the episode odometer flips to a cool round number, number 250. So that means it is Pedal Shift's Sester Centennial, a word we'll hear a lot as we move closer to uh, what is that? 2026 in the Sester Centennial of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. You heard Sester Centennial here first, maybe. That is a complete aside. <laughs> in any event, next episode, the 250th, the Sester Centennial, I'll be announcing my summer tour, which is happening super, super soon. Very excited to share with you uh, what it is, the uh, quirky nature of it, and more. That's all going to be next week if you are listening to this in real time. On this episode, a fun chat with Silva Florence, who is an experienced bicycle tourist and the author of many, many things, including her blog, The Silva Lining. Silva, Silva, isn't it? I, I, I think that's super clever. Uh, she talks about touring as a solo woman, how people who want to be allies to those solo women who are touring can do that without being creepy, and talking about some of her favorite adventures. <laughs> I am joined today by Silva Florence, who is an experienced bicycle tourist and the author of many things, including the incredibly entertaining The Silva Lining over at thesilvalining.com. Go check that out, where you too can earn free ice cream if you read the directions in the footer. Silva, hi, how are you today? Hello, nice to be here. I'm well, how are you? I'm very, very good. What got you started into traveling by bike? Well, it was like one of those things where... Um, I always love to travel. Like I went to my, I have really cool parents who are super supportive and they let me go with my, uh, French club to France and a little tiny piece of Italy when I was like 14 or something. And like, then I always liked bicycles. And then when I started dating my now ex-husband, he got, he was like a super cyclist. So I just jumped right on the bandwagon. That was like in 2005 when I got serious about cycling, mostly road biking, but it wasn't long before the, the two became one. Was it, was it kind of Europe that, that I, I feel like that's uh, cycle touring in Europe is more culturally a thing than it is here in the States was, was being in Europe kind of a thing that got the the multi-night kind of classic bike touring thing into your bloodstream? What, what, what kind of got that going? I did my first cycle tour when I was uh, in 2009. And actually it was when I started to work as um, a kind of do everything type person for a bike company called Experience Plus. And so uh, I came over here and my ex was a bike mechanic and I did everything and we would work and then travel. And so 2009, yeah, I did my first bike tour was maybe four days and three nights or something like that. And I was just immediately hooked. Like, yeah, in my night, my life was never the same after that. I feel like that's such a common story for people in bike touring. It's sort of like you, you kind of, you go, oh, that sounds intriguing. And then your first tour, you're like, oh no, it's <laughs> happening. It's, 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 it's all over. Everything is all about bike travel now. You're like, oh, I love suffering like this. It's so wonderful. <laughs> exactly. <It's> like... <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, obviously you, you, you caught the bug, which is a, probably a phrase I should not use in during post COVID, but anyways, <laughs> point being you, you got the, you got into bicycle touring and I mean, your your resume of travel is pretty impressive from where I said. Tell everybody where you've where you have gone by bicycle. Well, thanks. Uh, I mean, so after I caught the bug, the the correct bug, the biking bug, um, I did a lot of cycling uh, in completely remote places of the United States, like Colorado, Utah, 
Um, been down the entire California coast and a bike tour in Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Mexico, uh, lots of places in Europe having come over here and now living here. Um, so like Croatia, Austria, Slovenia, France, Italy, a bit of Germany. Mm, that's about it for now. <laughs> for <laughs> for now, exactly. Change. I have, to, I, have to, I have to ask you about Slovenia because for a, a brief period of time, this podcast was the number one travel or outdoor or travel podcast in Slovenia. So wow. tell me about tell me about Slovenia. I had a listener write in and, and it sounds like it was fabulous, but what was your experience there? So I've done one of the bike tours that I regularly lead starts in Klagenfurt, Austria, and it ends in Ljubljana, Slovenia, which is the capital, which I just love. Like every time I'm there, I think I could live here. And I think I massacred the pronunciation of that city's name. So I'm glad Everyone you know it. <laughs> There's like lots more letters than you think there would be. So um, my experience there is that Slovenians are incredibly hospitable, like jolly people. They, they're full of life and, uh, they, they love to, to host you and feed you and feed you schnapps. Um, I have a couple of good Slovenian friends. Sometimes, sometimes it can be kind of trafficy. It's a place that's not necessarily set up for bicycles and has sometimes mm, the kind of thing where people aren't really expecting to see you on a bicycle and they don't really know what to do. But you can find that anywhere in the world. So it's a lovely place. I was going to say, it sounds like West Virginia. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Everything you ticked off feels like West Virginia. Well, maybe not the schnapps. Maybe it's something different around here. But well, now here. that I now that you've indulged me and uh, you've told me about Slovenia, what's your what's kind of the favorite place you've ever done bike travel? And maybe kind of as a sub to that, because it could be the same or maybe it's different. What was the most challenging? Oh, man. Well, I love the island of Sardinia in mm. Italy. Um, I I live over here now. I live outside of Bologna in a medium-sized town called Faenza. And it's an incredible place to bike. But it's kind of hard to find the type of open spaces where you don't see anyone ever. Like, that's not so much of a thing in Europe as it is in the States. Like, wilderness doesn't there is wilderness but in italy not really Mm -hmm. but in sardinia you get that feeling you get especially if you go interior you get the feeling of vastness and wildness and it's just it's incredible it's such an interesting island and it's challenging it's very mountainous so yeah i love sardinia i have very very limited uh cycling experience in italy but where i we've done um uh, a yoga retreat. My partner is a, has led yoga retreats outside of Lucca, Italy, and I mm-hmm. just loved loved that town and just Luca this old nice med- medieval thing. Mm-hmm. And you know, just even cycling around on top of the wall for miles and miles and miles. Well, I guess kilometers, kilometers and kilometers. Bravo! Awesome, it, you did it. <laughs> it, it. It was really cool. And then and then I was like, oh well, I'll just cycle back to the to the retreat center up in the hills, and it just about ended me. <laughs> so. <laughs> There are I lo- I I really love the cycling culture in Italy and it's it's something that I would love to be able to pull off as a tour at some point but I my little Brompton is probably not exactly the best bike for it. You definitely like some some reason I don't know why like a lot of people have it in their mind that Italy is like flat or like or at least isn't as mountainous and hilly and challenging as it is but it's a really challenging country to to bike through. Because other than where I live, which is on the edge of the Apennine Mountains, and then um, in the other direction, it's just flat all the way to the sea. And the Talio di Paul, where the um, Venice is. Otherwise, it's not flat. It's a, it's a marvelous place if you like to, to climb and descend, for yeah. sure. 
I, I think that um, the folks who are more into kind of the lightweight, minimalist uh, bike packing kind of setup, you will be better served in the mountains than those of us who kind of go with a full pannier setup or whatever. Yeah. Have your gears ready, folks. That's all I have to say. Yeah, get your gears ready for sure. Low gears. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So Silva, one of my favorite posts that you have on your website is called Me, Myself, and My Tent, which is a a relatively recent post on your website. And Mm -hmm. you give nine tips for women who are thinking about solo touring. And I have never seen a a better set of um, tips, advice, etc. Can you give folks here who are listening, uh, I'm talking to the, to, the, to the ladies now, but I think that there are these tips are helpful for everyone. As an experienced solo rider, what you do and what you recommend? Yeah, because like we were talking about before we started this podcast, we, we are both on team get ladies on bikes. And so I, I really hope that some at some point, I don't always have like the shock and awe response when I tell people that, for example, I bicycled solo across the United States. Like it would be super cool if if, uh, any woman of color of anything, because obviously I'm, I'm a white woman. So I have a bit of a different experience and I travel through the world like as a white woman, but I hope that any woman anywhere could get on a bike and feel completely like normal. And like, it's not a weird thing to do. That's, that's what I hope. So, um, I think the the first thing that I think all people need to do, but especially women, unfortunately, is to learn how to trust ourselves and our intuition. That's like the most important thing that, that we can do. Um, because there, there are parts of you that understand better what is good and what's not than all of your senses can can uh, compile that information like your intuition knows, even if it makes no sense. So I would say getting to know yourself and your intuition is like the first, the first most important step. So I want to echo everything that you said about expanding bicycle touring for everyone. Um, I said this on the podcast before that if there's one goal that I have, it's to try to get more people that don't look like me out on out on the bikes there's plenty of white dudes out there doing it so (laughs) more women more people of color bravo i am super on your side so here's here's my question for you i'm a guy in the hiker biker camp who wants to be an ally uh to you as a solo female bike tourist but i don't want to be creepy dude how do you want me to approach things or not approach things oh i mean as far as i'm concerned I can tell if you're trying to be creepy or not. (laughs) Like if you're, if you're trying to, you know, hit on me or whatever, then I'll probably know it. So, and I don't think most guys, you know, that are sensitive to this fact and are sensitive to like, you know, they, they want to make females feel more comfortable. We'll pick up on that. Like it's intentions come through for sure. But I would just say like, kind of, letting me steer the conversation, maybe at the beginning or something like that, you know, and just keeping it really chill, keeping it really like low key. But I don't think that there's like a wrong way really to, to approach women, like as long as it's conversational and mellow. Yeah, I realized that uh, th- I, I was dangerously close to the "Hi, teach me how to how to be an adult," you know, kind of a thing <laughs> there. But I, 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 it's something that I think that it's important because I, I just, um, I, I remember on one of my trips that uh, I was I wasn't cycling with anybody in particular. It was just a group of of guys, all, all white a group gaggle of white dudes, and uh-huh. you know there was a solo uh, uh, a woman rider in camp, and you know. I I am, you know, just trying to be friendly and I was definitely getting the vibes back that it's just sort of like I not interested in engaging. And so my, my big thing has always been 
understand what is coming, the energy that is coming back at you as well, because there's going to be times when, you know, it's like somebody, it, if somebody is not interested in engaging in a conversation with you, please respect that. Um, Absolutely. And I, I just think that that's kind of a thing as well, you know, j- just because someone is not interested in interacting with a gaggle of white dudes, that does not necessarily mean that um, it's like, well, this person needs to, needs to, because we're here or whatever. Anyways. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Like about reading the energy of the other person and like you were smart to pick up on that vibe that like, you know, she was wanting to just be left alone for whatever reason. And so I think that's the total correct response. Every Everybody brings something different to the table and it could have been a, a, marathon day for her it could have been a multitude of different things it could have been just not comfortable with three dudes who are just kind of like you know laughing it up uh you know 20 feet away you know and so yeah respect respect the energy exactly because unfortunately like yeah you it wouldn't be weird if it was the other way around like if it was a guy and three girls like the guy wouldn't feel weird but unfortunately the girl might feel weird even if the guys are completely cool and like don't intend anything, but we just always have to kind of have our guard up a little bit more. So I think it's, it's nice to, to be a, a, a guy who, yeah, reads the situation and reads the the cues of the other person. Like, you know, I wouldn't be a, I wouldn't want to like some random guy to come up you know, and start talking to me, say in like a shadowy shared bathroom or something. Which maybe he wouldn't even, maybe he's just trying to ask about the weather for reals, but you would get those like weird alarm bells, even if there was nothing happening, because you just feel like vulnerable, I guess. I'm thinking like number one piece of advice here is do not sneak up on anybody, especially in (laughs) shadowy shared bathrooms. That's kind of like the number one do not do is is, is (laughs) part of what I'm getting here. Uh, But that's, I mean, I like to say file under duh for so many things on this podcast. I I think that's like, you know, towards the front of that file. So So sometimes I feel like there is like a huge duh file, but nobody reads it, you know? Yes. Yes. And if there's another thing that (laughs) this podcast is about is making sure to reveal to people the file under duh file. So um, (laughs) one of the things that I thought was really interesting that I never really thought about because I, here I am sitting apex privilege, white male dude. Right. So of course I don't think about these things because I haven't had to, because high privilege. But um, the the idea of getting to know folks who are the campsite hosts in a hiker biker con- uh, context, or mm-hmm. um, and again, this all, is all coming from your, your blog post. What are some other ideas that you have in that context? Or how has that benefited you? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of like creating allies wherever I go. <laughs> also, because it's really a fun way to to get to know people and to make connections, because I feel like no matter what kind of travel you're doing, the people that you meet are half of the fun, if not more. So, um, and the things that you can learn from them. So this goes to along with following my intuition, because I'm not going to approach someone that I don't feel good about, but generally, yeah, people at the fee booths at the campgrounds, the camp hosts, um, often also like people at police and fire stations. I typically feel good about, going to ask them for information as a single woman. And there, I don't usually feel like I'm going to be in trouble if they know where I'm going to sleep, you know? Yeah. And they, and they often will offer like police and camp hosts will often just organically offer to like swing by and check up on me, you know, or pass by my camp during the night and just look and see if there's like any dead bodies outside or anything, you know? (laughs) Which, which, you know, none of that has happened, thankfully. No, so. definitely not. <laughs> well, anyways, I really, I really uh, encourage folks who are listening to go check out that uh, post. It's, it's me, myself, and my tent. I've got a link in the show notes to all of that. Um, I wanted Thanks. to pivot away to something that I, I'm intensely curious about. You've been guiding bike tours for, it, it, I think, over 10 years now, and You've done, you and I have one thing in common. We've taken something that is a joy in our life and we've done something to kind of make it like a job. You more so than Mm -hmm. me. I mean, the podcast is, you know, sort of, 
it's sort of as more of a side hustle than anything else. But it, for you, it's a, like a job job. Sometimes when you put the joy into a job, it means you never work a day in your life. And sometimes it means it kind of steals from some of that joy. Where mm-hmm. have you found that landing for you? And in, um, yeah, anyways, where have you found that landing? Well, to be completely honest, the bike touring thing has been a part of my life since 2009, but it's never been a full-time job. And I do think that that's probably partially why I still really do love it because um, it's a pretty intense job when you go out on tour. You work 24-7 basically for 10 days or so. Um, And so uh, my other colleagues will do you know, back-to-back tours all summer long. I'll do maybe two or three across the summer in normal non-COVID years. Um, So I think for me, that's a perfect balance because I get to go, I get to lead these tours. I work hard, I make good money, but then I come back and I don't burn myself completely out guiding because I definitely could, at least for me personally, I think if I did it full time, I might eventually not want to do it because it is very, very intense. But as it is now, I love it. It is part of the challenge, the people sometimes, because I, one of the things that I, you, you were stuck with whomever you are riding with in that mm-hmm. scenario. Is that one of the bigger challenges sometimes? I'm sure it's mostly like, you know, sunshine and bunnies and everything is cool. And <laughs> if you're listening and been on one of Silva's tours, it's not you. But anyways. <laughs> It's, it's, um, it is the clients sometimes it's just mm, like our tours are, we cater to Americans and I'm an American too. So I feel like I can speak to this. We're very demanding. Um, we desire, we desire what we we pay for. And these are higher level, level tours. So sometimes there are people that are very demanding. Not always. I've met some incredible people and I've also met people that are incredible and demanding both. So it's just a a very full on job and there's, you know, 20 some uh, mature adults on bikes scattered across a certain part of Italy and there's vans and there's luggage and there's weather and there's accidents and there's different languages. And um, it's a combination of things that make it really interesting and never boring, but also very exhausting. So it's just a mix of all those things. It's a fascinating business. And when I was sort of in in between sort of career transition-y things as I want to be at times, uh, I, I briefly considered, oh, what if I did something like that? And then I quickly said, no, nope, nope, I am not built for that. <laughs> nope. You have to be a very special person. And I think, Silva, you are one of those people. So I oh, think that's well, thank amazing. thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I wanted to kind of close things out because, I, you know, we've been talking about Italy. How is Italy doing with COVID? Because I know at the beginning of everything, Italy was in just in, in terrible straits. And I know that you were in lockdown. Um, how's it doing? And how do you think touring in Europe is going to be this year as we hopefully, fingers crossed, climb out of it? I hope so. Um, Italy, it's been quite a ride here because we were the kind of the first people to go into this mess. And yeah, we had like a three month lockdown, which is really, really intense. Um, and I did a bike tour like the first day that I could get out of my house. I definitely was planning a bike tour while I was locked in the house. But um we we were kind of backed up for a long time because of the AstraZeneca stuff. Um, and now AstraZeneca is back, but it's only available to certain age groups. And this was all over Europe that the vaccines were held up. But Italy is also notoriously uh, disorganized <laughs> and a bureaucratic mess. So I think it's been a little bit even augmented here because of all that. We're, we're starting, though, to get back on track with vaccines. They're, at least in the region where I live, they're vaccinating people, or at least the bookings are open for people 40 and over now. So we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. That's fantastic. But we've we've had very strict rules. We've, we still have a curfew. The curfew we've had since the beginning of November. It was 10, now it's 11. Um, we're required to wear masks everywhere, even outside, really. Um, we have, you can have, now we can have four people to a vehicle for a while. It was two. I mean, we've had very stringent restrictions for a while. So 
we're, we're looking forward to, I don't know what normal life is anymore, but we're looking forward to, to summer and being able to just enjoy life a bit more. That sounds really similar to what my cousin's experiencing in Belgium. She lives in Brussels and Mm -hmm. down to the, the curfew and the, the, changing curfew and the back and forth and things like mm-hmm. that so yeah here's hoping that, a wild ride oh my gosh yeah and and here's hoping that europe can can come back and, and you know that we can all get kind of the summer we deserve after the last year but you know baby steps and and follow the science and i'm really glad to hear that the astrazeneca vaccine is is um more widely available now because that's um that seems to be what's working over this direction so yeah 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 i mean uh, I'm just happy to see that we're, we're making some progress and, uh, hopefully we'll get to that magic number where we can kind of really relax and start living our lives the way we want to again sometime soon ish soon ish. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so Silva, so I, I know that you've got some irons in the fire and stuff like that. So as we, as we wrap things up, what's, what's next for you? What, what do you see on the horizon knowing full well that we're sort of still in COVID and planning beyond more than 14 hours ahead is kind of a thing, but what, what, what is next for you? <laughs> uh, well, we are heading into summer. Um, I'm also an English teacher, so I'll have maybe some little summer camps or maybe a definitely, hopefully a break. Um, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to lead a couple of bike tours, maybe in the fall. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I've got a, a book that I'm working on about my trip across the United States alone that I'm trying to send to agents and editors. So that'll keep me entertained. And, um, actually in uh, about a week, I'm going on a little mini bike tour with some friends. So that's something I haven't been able to do in a long time. I'm very excited about it. That's amazing. I'm I'm so happy to hear that that uh, the world is starting to normalize a little bit on a bike for you and for so many people. It just makes me very very happy to hear. Mm-hmm. So, Silva, thank you so much for joining. Everybody, go check out Silva's uh, website, thesilvalining.com. Silva, appreciate you spending time here on Pedal Shift. Thanks for having me on. It's been awesome. I appreciate it. I want to thank Silva one more time for coming on the show and giving us all of that fountain of wisdom that she brought to all of us. Again, go check her stuff out over at uh, thesilvalining.com. And don't forget, next week, episode number 250, the Sester Centennial, we will be doing a big tour reveal for my summer tour. So come check it all out in a week. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not into the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skado, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgadis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Henkel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Avilas Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gebhardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Goffman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Piroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messenger, David Grotke, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lecko, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCulloch, John Hickman, Jack Smith, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Dave Fletcher, James Stratakis, David Neves, Mike Lazuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, 
David Wilde, Matthew Sponseller, Chad Reno, Daniel Greger, Spartan Dale, Carolyn Ferguson, Peggy Littlefield, Lauren Allensmith, and new to the society, Eric Burns. And thanks to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.